very happy to have Mike Bromwich back with me, ex National Parks um, warden, wanky warden. And um, uh, Mike's got so much to tell us. I never quite know where to start. But um, for today, what we want to talk about is three um, of the outstanding chaps who, who served with the department, all of whom lost their lives basically in the line of duty. Um, as we all know, this is, uh, this is not a profession for sissies. And um, these, were, these were tough guys who, who gave their all. And um, their story is a, uh, one of courage and, and uh, commitment. And so, Mike, yeah, I think this, this um, little chat this afternoon should really be a, a tribute to Willie De Beer, uh, Robin Hughes, and Tim Wellington. Um, Mike, you knew Willie De Beer well. Uh, just tell us a little bit about Willie the man, um, and and then we can walk work through some, some of the interesting events in his life. Good afternoon to you, Hannes. Um, Willem, yes. Okay. I really got to know him in Harare when he was warden roving control. You know, but our paths did cross from time to time, and um, he was a remarkable man. He, he was born in, let me just check the date, get it, 1925 in South Africa, and his parents, are, you know, uh, emigrated up to Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and he was schooled in Amtali, senior school at Amtali Boys High. Um, he did have, he made a lot of friends with the, with the neighboring farmers, particularly the Bazaidnard family, where he, he learned, you know, his bush, a lot of his bushcraft and his love for the felt out on the Sabi area, did a lot of hunting, a lot of horse riding. He was, I'm just trying to get, just put my mind around these sort of, these, some of the facts, early facts about him. In 1944, he was called up after school um, and he was selected to, on an office, get it, an officer cadet course and amongst, you know, there were nine others, amongst whom was uh, Peter Walls, who later was to become the, the general of the, the Supreme, El Supremo of the Rhodesian Army. Um, he was, they went across to Britain where he was going to do his cadet, officer cadet training. When they got there, the, um, the European, um, or the, the armistice had been signed, or the, or the war had been finished. And um, Willie, Willie stayed on for a while. They were requested to, the colonial troops were requested to sign on for a further six years. Willie declined and then came back to, to Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Um, in 46, he joined the Southern Rhodesia uh, Army, the Staff Corps, and spent, spent 20 years uh, in, in, the, in the Army. Rising to the rank um, of captain, he was the RSM. And, you know, he, Willie is a huge man, a big man. And uh, he, was, he was actually feared. The, I think a lot of the chaps who are watching this, uh, who did the cadet camps at Nkoma, will remember, remember Willem. Um, and you know he definitely was feared, but he, as we got really got to know Willem, we would you know you realize that his bark was far worse, far worse than his bite. Uh, he was actually a very very gentle man. But let me just go back to when he joined the department. He joined in did twenty years of service in the army. He left in sixty five, and then applied to join the department. Like a lot of us, um, there was a waiting period, and Willem must have put his application in much the same time as I did. Uh, Robin Hughes. Dave Scammell, and we all joined the department much about the right, about the same time. I think Willem was a couple of months, maybe six weeks after I joined with uh, Robin Hughes and uh, Dave Scammell, John Osborne. John White came across from the admin block, but Willem joined and, you know, the man, you know, far senior to us in years, he was 40 years old when he joined the department, but he'd had a lot of uh, experience um, in the bush. And he was posted to the, what was then the newly formed Wanky uh, Culling Unit under Len Harvey. The other rangers that were there was, as far as, and it was only one other ranger, Ronnie De Beer, uh, Ronnie uh, Van Heerden, think about Ronnie Van Heerden. Um, and their task was the, to reduce the elephant population in Wanky and the buffalo populations. They were to reduce them um, to the figures, I think there was a thousand elephant to be taken off. 
and or maybe not as you know, I'm just trying to get that vector. On. Anyway, there were a number of elephants to be taken off, uh, and quite a substantial number of buffalo. But apart from from that that, that job, I don't think any of us really enjoyed that sort of culling operations. Nobody did. Um, Billum's field work varied. Uh, he he was involved in control work in the Gwai area, line control there. That seemed to be a, an endless endless problem, and also in the, in the Chilocho area. And I think you know when we looked to look at Billy. Um, I don't know whether he, he had um, a love-hate relationship with Lyme, but he paths always seemed to cross with Lyme wherever he went. And his first incident with Lyme was, I think, in 1968, when he was asked to go down into the Chilocho area to deal with uh, problem or stock killing lions in the Chilocho area um, near Koridziba. Well, he went down there and he took with him his young son, who's about seven years old, and his trackers went down there and they patrolled the area fairly extensively. They found two lions that had been dealt with by the locals. They'd been trapped and shot. And uh, Billy actually met up with the, the chap who had the firearm and he had a look at it and was an old, uh, old muscle loader. And, you know, Billy, being very sensitive um, to, the, to the old people, just said to the chap, listen, you know, uh, you shouldn't have it. I suggest you pension the rifle that your your muzzle loader off, which the chap did do. Um, but Willem can carry, uh, carried on with these patrol, and they found another another bunch of lions, but it killed some stock. They went after them. They shot one, and he wounded a lioness, and he followed this lioness in the thick bush. It got hold of Billy and started to maul him badly. And when I say maul him badly, I mean excess, you know, extremely badly. He ended up by putting his hand into its mouth. It was, it was biting him on the shoulder, on, on the arm, on the thigh, and he ended up by putting his mouth into, so his hand into the mouth of the of the lion, screaming for his his, his tracker to 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 shoot the lion, which he, which he did. He discharged his Billum's double four seventy double discharge, and which put the tracker on the back, the rifle on the ground but it managed to kill, kill the lion. He was obviously very, very scared that, you know, he would lose his, lose his hand with, or, you know, his arm with, with, the, with the shot because the game scout put the rifle to the, to the head of the lioness, but that didn't happen. And uh, Billum sort of, you know, extracted himself from the lioness. His hand was exceptionally badly damaged and his arm, he was bleeding profusely. Anyway, to, you know, just to tell quite a long story short, Billum being what he, what he you know, the person he was, um, sort of tidied himself up a bit, had a plan to get the lion back, and he set, set off back for, to his vehicle, limping badly. I mean, his, the injuries to his, his thigh were bad. His arm was a mess. And he get, got back to the, to the vehicle where his son was, who was seven years old. He made sure that typical Willem looks after everybody, look, looking after everybody else at his own expense or didn't worry about himself. He made sure that the, his son had some lunch, uh, the Game Scouts were catered for, they tidied up their camp, and they then set off to Pumula, where there was a clinic and a, uh, a doctor was in attendance. And that was a fairly long drive, and Billum shared the driving with his son. Now, you can imagine a seven-year-old boy, um, Billum battled, trying to put, the, put his foot in the clutch, his left leg was damaged badly, and they shared the steering. He said in his notes, and, and his story that I, you know, that was given to me by his daughter um, very kindly. They shared the driving to Pumula. They got there, the doctor wasn't there. So the sister attended to him. She was actually horrified at his, at his injuries. Anyway, they patched him up. She gave him some morphine and uh, I think it was a tetanus injection or penicillin and to relieve the pain. Middle of the night, Billum didn't really sleep at all. His game scouts were camping outside and so was uh, young Billum, his son. And early in the morning, uh, Willem got up and said, we're packing up, we're going back to, to Wanky, uh, to main camp. Well, as they were about to leave, the doctor pitched up, looked, it stopped Willem and they had a quick look at him and, and the examination realized that Willem had to go and get you know, proper medical treatment. They couldn't, they couldn't do that at the Pomola clinic. So Willem set off back to main camp. The drive must've been horrific. Look, it must've taken him seven, eight hours to get back. He got back in time to be put onto the Harari flight or Salisbury flight, which must have been about four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon. He was seen off by Bruce Austin, his provincial warden. Bruce's remarks to the air hostess was, 
please look after this man. He is, uh, he's, he is very important to us. Uh, he's precious, not only to us, but also as lion bait. I mean, Bruce had a bit of a warped sense of humor. Now we need him for all sorts of things, one of which may be lion bait. Anyway, Willem went off to Arori. He was picked up by a doctor and then admitted into the Salisbury Hospital. He was there for just over two weeks, I think. And he had a fractured hand, fractured arm. Uh, and very badly bitten around. He returned, uh, I think, to two and a half, three weeks later to to, May, to, to Sharpie, where they were based, and uh, he carried on his duties. Now, we go from there uh, to the Sharpie tragedy, and uh, this has been reported very, very widely. I have read the Billum's account, I've read Hazel's account, and I've read Colin Matthews' account. Colin was Hazel's uh, son and Billum's stepson from his second marriage. It was Easter 1972 that that incident took place. But to go back in time a little bit, which we, we need to look at, the Sharpie camp was a culling camp. It was open. Um, there were pens. There was a processing factory run by Paul Schrobler. And lions used to wander in and out of the camp on an odd occasion. A short while before the incident, a lioness or a lion, Willem actually didn't actually know it was a lioness at the time, but a lion had behaved somewhat peculiarly and which put, you know, sort of made Willem think that there was, might have been something wrong. They did track it on one occasion when it left the camp, but after, you know, an hour or so's walking, they realized, look, we haven't got authority to do anything about it. And it's a pointless exercise following up and, and possibly provoking an incident and having to destroy the lion. So they returned back and Willem reported to, to Len Harvey that there was a problem that they, he feared there was a, a problem with a lion, that there was a lion in, in, in uh, you know, a emaciated lion possibly, or um, a lion that had been injured. And she was sort of hanging around the camp. And uh, he was a little bit concerned about it. And he asked whether they could, they could shoot an animal. And it was a little bit and, uh, and then try and entice and move the animal away. He wasn't given permission from, from uh, Len. Anyway, a few days later, one of the, the game scouts reported that a lion had tried to get into, into his hut. It had raided his chicken coop and killed all the chickens and tried to get into his hut. Well, that really put the wind up with him. And he went and investigated. He spoke to all the scouts and the laborers in the camp, in the Sharpie camp. And then they went and had a look around the camp itself and found that the lion had gone into a deserted house. It was actually Ranger Dendy's house. Now, Ranger Dendy wasn't there at the time. He was away on days off, which is very fortunate. Uh, the lion had walked into his hut, walked over, and, and Willem reports that the house, it was dark, it was thatched. It said, he said it absolutely reeked of lion. Uh, they could see, you could see the marks where it had been scratching the walls, it had urinated and um, all over the show. And he said absolutely reeked of lion. Um, he went out and looked around. And they found where the lion had actually gone to sleep outside Len Harvey's house, underneath one of the windows of the house. Now, just to put everybody in, you know, put this in perspective, those houses didn't have windows. They didn't have doors. Uh, there were open spaces for both. Um, so there was a gap. Poland dug a hut, so there was a gap for a window and a gap for a door. Willem again spoke to, to Len, and uh, Len said, look, we, we can't touch it. It obviously, and according to Willem, had, um, had had his knuckles wrapped once before for dealing with a lion, and uh, so he was reluctant to do anything about it. Anyway, that, 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 is, that is the picture as it stood prior to Easter 1972. That long, week, long weekend, Hazel's son, accompanied by three of his friends, came up from South Africa uh, to celebrate his passing of a university degree and some spend time with, with his mother and, uh, and with Willem. They went off to the falls, they came back, they had a chat that one that evening and everybody went to bed. The lights, the generator was switched off and everybody went to bed. It must have been close to midnight. Willem was woken up by sound of running feet and hysterical screams. And it was um, Jean Harvey Len's wife. Now they'd been married for 10 days. This is a tragedy. Willem put a torch on and immediately switched it off again. She was covered in blood. She'd been, been savaged by this lion and she screamed and cried out, the lion is, 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 is killing and, and eating Len. It must have been a horrific sight. Hazel came through, she heard the commotion and uh, she ushered and took the gene away. Colin um, heard the commotion as well and came through and Willem said, look, we've got serious trouble. We've got to get across and help 
help Len and just see if we, what we can do for him. And one must remember that, you know, the camp was in darkness. They had to get the generator started. Um, their first place of place to call was the office. They went across the office where the firearms were and uh, they took out two firearms, one of which happened to be a very light caliber rifle, a 243, which uh, Willem handed to, to Colin. And he fussied around in the dark and picked up another rifle, which turned out to be a 375, got some ammunition. And then they went to start the lighting plant, which they managed to get started. And that, that lit up the office and provided lights for the, for the houses, but there were no, no other sort of lights around. And they cautiously made their way across to, to Slyn's house. Now, there's a photograph of, of, of Lynn's house, which I've sent to you, and you can just see it. Willem got there and he sort of tried to peer into the house, which was lit. He couldn't see anything. He sort of raised himself up the one window and looked in the open gap, looked in a little bit further, couldn't see anything. And then he stumbled, put his head through and his shoulders through, not knowing that this lioness was actually lying directly below him, uh, below the window. It was lying and watching him. When he stuck his sort of half, you know, his torso through to look, have a better look, this lion just grabbed up and grabbed him on the face and clawed him. And uh, in the melee, they fell out backwards out of, out of the hut. And uh, the lioness just proceeded to, to really chew and um, bite Willem. It must have been absolutely terrifying. It pitched black. The lion initially scalped Willem. Um, he said his right eye came out of his socket, he couldn't see, and he was blinded. And I don't know quite how long this is actual, the savaging you know, carried on for, but in the end, um, the lion started to, to lick Willem's face. Um, he was in excessive pain. The next minute, there was a, a scream, a blood curdling scream, and it was Colin. The lion had turned from Willem, obviously Colin had moved or done something, she'd seen Colin, and the lion turned onto Colin and started mauling Colin. She was, at that stage, the lion was still half lying on Willem's legs. And Willem sat up. He couldn't see. Started to put his hands out. He found the stock uh, of a rifle and managed to, 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 to extract the rifle, cock it, fired three shots, one after the other, into this lioness. Everything went still. And Colin said to, sorry, Willem said to Colin, 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 are you all right? And Colin's reply was, I'm all right, but I think you've shot off my, shot off my right, my right hand, shot off my hand. Bill and managed to sort of, they managed to sort of get the lioness off them. And between the two, Colin leading Bill, because he couldn't see, they went back to, made their way back to the house, to Bill's house. Now imagine the state of, of Hazel when she saw them both. But Bill and Bill being just an, Absolute story. I mean, I cannot even imagine. And I mean, I try and I close my eyes when I think about this. Uh, when I think that his concern wasn't for himself, it was for the station, it was for Colin, it was for Lynn, it was for Jean. And he did the right thing. He gave Hazel detailed instructions of what had to be done, that uh, the senior scout had to be woken up, had to go through to, to main camp, to alert the authorities, to to get um, a, 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 a helicopter flown in from, from Wanky. And this, is, this was typical Billum. He, he was, you know, he doing, tidying up everything, getting it all organized was his priority. And as I say, this, this was um, Billum's you know, priority. Well, they patched him up a little bit. He lay down on the bed and, you know, Hazel went off to main camp, drove through to main camp with one of the, one of the game scouts, Derek Williams and one other, trying to think who the other ranger was, came back. And they got back to, the, to Sharpie pretty quickly. And at four o'clock, a helicopter arrived from, from Wanky. And uh, it was pitch black, it was raining. And the helicopter touched down. They put on Jean, Colin, and Willem. And off they went to hospital where there was Dr. Hay who attended to, to Willem. He was there in hospital, I'm just trying to think for, initially, I think for six weeks. He had 162 stitches put into his head, his face. 
his eye was was put back again. He would require he required another four um, operations to his eye, which these those operations were done in in Salisbury or Harare. Um, and there were two staples, metal staples, put into his forehead to secure it. Um, Willem, to, to, you know, to, to everything we've just said already, you know, was more concerned about Colin. Colin was in the same ward. They sort of, they chatted and as I said, you know, he was very concerned about him. They were flown later to Harare, to Salisbury, and he went into the Andrew Fleming Hospital where he, he um, had these, these other eye operations and uh, was finally discharged. I think it was in September, which would have made it about two, three months after the operation, the end of September that he was actually declared fit for duty and, and then reposted he was he was sent he was reposted to Thule and we'll go into that in a moment Len, Sharpie, um, Mike Len Harvey did um, did he have a weapon did he manage to put up any resistance or did, <clears throat> did the, the lion get him in his bed the lion uh, initially attacked Jean and Len went to a rescue it, it actually jumped through the window onto onto Jean and Len went to a rescue. They didn't have any weapons in the houses. Uh, that was for security reasons. They were all locked in safes, in the, in, in the gun safes in, in the office. So nobody had any weapons. And uh, in what, some of these notes and, uh, and his autobiography, which he's written, he wrote up, he said, Willem used to say, I kept a, a handful of rocks close to my bed, which I used to toss out the window of the door when lions used to come a bit too close. So, I mean, that's all they had. So they had no weapons at all. So yeah, Len was, yeah, Len was actually you know, sort of mauled and, and uh, partially devoured, which is actually very, very sad. He was buried in Bulaway in an unmarked grave in Paul Kutsia, myself, and uh, Richard Elwood went to, to look for his grave. We believe we found it, um, but it's an unmarked grave, basically. But if we go now to, to Thule, um, Len took, uh, sorry, Willem took over from Johnny, Johnny Bunce and was in the safari area for a couple of years. And due to form, you know, uh, it, it was a, it was, well, it was then called, it was Thule CHA, Thule Controlled Hunting Area. It only became a, declared a safari area in 1975 when the new act was promulgated. And once again, uh, uh, Bullum's concern, you know, Bullum was sort of active in, in, in game management. They did a lot of cropping there. They had to do cropping. They, and he was in charge of, of the controlled hunting area where there was regular uh, clients coming in and hunting. Well, more um, Rhodesians hunting at those days than anybody else. There was a fair amount of poaching in the, in the, in the communal areas and in the, in, in the Thule area itself. And on the, I'm not quite sure which date it was, but Willem sent out a patrol of six scouts into the circle and onto the, onto the Shashi River to, to check for poaching. The scouts, two of the scouts, they split up uh, from the other four and they, they went into some thick area bordering the communal area and they found uh, a lioness in a snare. They found one dead and a lioness in a snare. She was still alive. They tried to look at her and she sprung at them and they believed that she'd actually been shot, uh, but she because he fell backwards. They didn't know what 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 the what the story was. Anyway, they they didn't wait around to look, and they took off and they ran into another pride of lions that were excep exceptionally aggressive, causing them to to drop their packs. They kept their rifles they, um, and they took off, and they went back to they made their way back to to Tuli and report to 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 Billum that they'd uh, there was a lion and a snare, and then there was another dead one. So Willem got some more scouts and they set off back to, to have a look at this. They came to the scene where this lion, 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 lion was and this, this, this lioness was and she, she too had a, she growled and, and she, she too, she sprang at, at, at Willem only to be sort of pulled back by the snare which Willem discovered that was actually round her neck and around her shoulders. And uh, so Willem sort of backed up a little bit wearily and true to, true to, to character, you know, he, his immediate thought was, how do I get this lion out? You know, I don't want to kill it. How do I get this lioness out of the snare? He had a 306 with him, five rounds of ammunition. Um, so I think it's just, you know, it's just typical of him. Uh, and uh, 
So he moved the scout into a secure position, fairly easy, moved her away, said, let, let, let the lion concentrate on the, on the scout that moved away, and he tried to crawl a little bit closer. Didn't take his eyes, the lioness didn't take his, you know, her eyes off him, sprang at him a couple of times, and he pulled back, and Willem sat down, I don't quite sure what the distance was, but it, well, you could have, it would have been closer than 20 meters. And Willem had a look through the, his telescopic sights, saw the cable, the, the, the wire that was holding the line, and uh, thought, right, I will, I will break the wire with a shot and free the line and she'll take off the line. Is. His first shot, uh, he missed, he just sounded with him and uh, he was an exceptional shot. Second shot he missed, he didn't miss the third shot uh, and with which, with which the line, lioness was freed and she didn't turn away from Willem. She came in a full-blooded charge to Willem. Well, he had no option but to shoot her at very, very close quarters. His first bullet uh, struck her in the chest and put her down or of course her to hesitate and his second, his second bullet put her down. Now he was out of ammunition. Uh, his five rounds had gone and uh, he hurriedly sent the uh, scout back to the vehicle to get his 470 and to bring some more ammunition. Well, the lioness did die and he had a look at it. And they, what they found, that, uh, that she'd been snared, they found two other lions there. So the locals, which is something to think about, which we need to actually put a, a brief mention here, is about problem animal control, that the locals had taken um, steps to sort their own problems out, maybe um, out of revenge or, because I really don't doubt that Willem didn't didn't answer calls, you know, promptly. But this is this is this is a, this is one of the tragedies that if, if problem animals are not dealt with, you know, um, speedily and uh, promptly, that the the community takes steps to to deal with the, with the problems themselves. Exactly the same, and it happened in Chilocho, where they they killed two lions using gin traps and and spears and muzzleloader, and the same had happened here in Tuli. But this was actually in the circle, but the the lions had been skinned and mutilated and various parts taken, obviously, for witchcraft. Um, but we took the, the skins back and the carcasses back. So that just um, gives you an idea of, you know, of, of the character of the, of, of Willem. Puts aside his safety completely, more concerned with the well-being of lions, the lion, did his utmost to try and extract that lion, you know, at his own peril from the snare. Mike, he, while he was in the Tule area, he also um, he got an award for saving a game scout. I think he was drowning in the Shashi River. Yes, yes. Um, he was actually given the uh, an award. I'm just going to just think what he was, what he was given. Um, it was an MLM. Let's have a look. Member of the Legion of MLM, Merit. Yeah, yeah, Legion of Merit. That that was for the Len Harvey incident, but he he was cited in another in, in a newspaper article written by Ted Machel and again for bravery. Uh, the Shashi River came down in flood. And that is you know, an absolutely huge river. For people that know it, it or don't know it, it's probably half a kilometer wide. And it comes down in raging torrents. The game scout was washed away. Willem was told and at night took a boat onto the river at his own peril. The spotlight searched the river and eventually found the, the game scout on a submerged stream wedged in the fork of a tree. Willem, you know, Willem, we don't know what would have happened, whether the game scout would have been, you know, been able to hold on through the night, we just don't know. But Willem managed to rescue the game scout. They, they got back to the camp, camp safely. But so there again, there's the same thing. Incredible bravery at, you know, at, um, he, just, he did, didn't worry about himself. His concern was his colleagues, his staff and friends. Mm -hmm. And Willem would walk to the ends of the earth, barefoot, in pain, whatever it was, that was Willem. And as I say, he demonstrated this time and time and time again. Um, there is that article I have sent you a photograph of, which you know you'd like to display. He got the MLM for, for bravery, for, for rescuing Len, uh, or trying to go to, to assist Len at his own peril. Willem, after Tui, went to, was posted to, to Teresa, Teresa Safari as the, as the ranger in charge. He was there for a couple of years. He had also had a very, very sad incident there where. He lost a game scout to an elephant, an, an enraged elephant cow, which they never found out why. 
Um, she charged the vehicle, hit the vehicle from the back. Unfortunately, the game scout panicked and jumped out. And the elephant killed nice on the game scout right in front of Willem's eyes and uh, absolutely massively broken. Mike, um, let's just move on a bit. Um, we uh, we're into the mid 70s. Uh, the war's escalating. Um, the National Parks gets drawn more and more into the conflict. Um, and particularly on the tracking side. And uh, then that ended, that brought about the formation of the Tracker Combat Unit, which was um, to a large extent, National Parks guys, um, rangers and, and scouts, black and white, um, really came to prominence um, as, as the war escalated. I understand that's correct. Um, at, the, at, at the start of, of Operation Hurricane, um, right at the beginning, Tracker teams were deployed. They consisted of those days of one ranger and, and two game scouts. Paul Kutsio was uh, contacted, actually requested to supply uh, trackers and Oliver Coltman and one or two other chaps from the valley with the initial teams that went in with two trackers and uh, started the tracking. And then Paul, they basically, what they were doing is with two weeks, a stint of two weeks in and then out and the next tracker team would come in um, it was it was very very loosely arranged. Paul was Paul was you know, very excuse me very very competent, and he called for volunteers to do that to do the tracking tracking units. So Oliver Colton went in. I can't remember the second or the third. I was about the third or the fourth volunteer to go in, and we went to Centenary, and then up up to Mount Darwin. Well, as the as the as the hostilities you know progressed. Um, the teams changed from one ranger and two scouts to a team of four, two rangers and two scouts. They, it was deemed to be more efficient and company for, for the support for the, for the rangers and the staff to have, have two officers with them, um, which they did. The, I mean, the, the, the scouts were, were very reliant on, 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 the, on, on, on their field staff. They, they didn't want to track with, with, with security forces. They had experience uh, earlier on um, in the earlier operations, um, tracking for security forces. And they were, they were very, very willing to, to track with, with, with the officers that they knew and who they'd worked with. And uh, so this, is, this was the reason for, for, the, for, the, for the combat teams. In 1973, you know, the, the war was escalating, Operation Hurricane. They were not getting the kills that they wanted wanted to, and there was you know, a call for you know for more teams to go in. And I remember getting a call from uh, from head office from from Dr. Child that I should go to Centenary that um, and report to to, the, to brigade headquarters there and to get there you know as soon as possible. Well, I, I I didn't know, and I sort of phoned and said, well, you know, do you want to you know shall I bring my trackers? And they said, well, you can bring your trackers. Uh, with you, but you know we need to see you up here. Anyway, I went up there, met Brigadier Hickman, Captain Mike Graham, Dumpy Pierce, who was also a captain, and Neil Creel, who was also a captain. They were all in the jock. Anyway, they talked to me about Andre Robbie. They said you you obviously knew that Andre Robbie had been killed, and they talked to me about pseudo operations and whether and asked whether I was um, willing to to do a couple of specific tasks for them. Um, which involved the security around Centenary. They said, listen, we'll give you a, you know, you don't have to give us an answer this evening, but you can tell us in the morning. But I thought about this, I'll just, you know, I firmly believe that, that, you know, at the time, which I still do now, that um, the only way to fight, uh, you know, the insurgency war is to, is to get onto the same level where, where they are and, you know, for the fight on the same terms as they do. So I agreed to, to do that. And uh, so we went from there. I drew kit the next day. And was deployed with taken out by Land Rover and uh, handed over to Stretch Franklin and his ex SAS and his team of pseudo operations, which was quite, uh, believe me, it was an experience. We did it, I was there with them for two or three days and came back again. And I realized then, you know, you realize actually how unfit you were in comparison to these chaps that are, are covering 20, 30 kilometers across the countryside every day. 
a lot of it walk, they were walking bare feet. And you know, suddenly realize actually how unfit, unfit you were because I was not used to carrying a pack for any length of period and stuff like that. Anyway, um, when we got back, I learned that Robin Hughes was coming across as well. And that Robin was coming across from national parks for a two year contract. He'd signed on to the army uh, or being seconded to the army um, for, two, for a two year contract. Now, just to go back a little bit in time and with Robin, Robin Hughes, he'd resigned from the department in, in 1969, I think it was, or 69, 68, 69. Anyway, he resigned and he'd formed a safari company with Jeff, Jeff Sutri, um, Kariba, and Robin, you know, did, uh, took tours around and uh, conducted a uh, guy who was doing a professional guiding job in, in, in the in, in the Mono Pools area in the valley and doing wildlife forms. But he rejoined the department mid-73 and was posted to Yurungi, also in the valley in, in, in a controlled hunting area. And so he'd been there for three months and he'd obviously been approached as well. And he was a fluent linguist, Shona linguist. And Robin volunteered to come across. He held the rank of Lieutenant, the Tracker Combat Unit, uh, Alan Savory's Tracker Combat Unit that Alan Savory formed. And Robin came there. When well, we met up with, I met up with Robin when he came there. It was great to see him, it really was. I mean, Robin and I joined the department at the same date, you know, um, in July, I think it was 1966. And although, our, you know, we, we were posted different parts of the country, our paths used to cross from time to time. We always used to get together, chat and uh, reminisce. And, and uh, I went once or twice with Robert. But it was good to have him there. And we did some retraining with uh, Stretch Franklin in the Horseshoe area. We followed the, you know, we got to learn the, the pseudo tactics of the passwords and procedures and stuff like that. And it was actually an amazing experience. Now, the Horseshoe Block was in the, in the Sibalilo area. We were camped under these beautiful Raffia Rufia palms. And... Uh, the one evening, I'm just trying to think who it was. Uh, I don't know whether it was Pete Stanton, um, but I think it might have well have been Pete Stanton from Special Branch brought out a recent capture. Uh, and he'd been, been manacled, had leg irons on. And he just said, I'll be bringing him out and uh, you know, leave him with you. And uh, you can learn from him what's been happening. Well, we sat around that fire in the evening and uh, Stretch Franklin, being the, you know, the senior NCA was a sergeant with SAS, uh, chatted to the slug, and we learned, we learned a tremendous amount from him, just listening to him talk. Anyway, when it was all over, it was time to, you know, to, to doss down. We all sort of lay down on, on our um, ground sheets. And I remember saying to Robin, it's incredibly strange. We've got tame terrorists here, MRM, not wasn't MRM, no, Fulimo, Fulimo soldiers, excellent Fulimo soldiers, and we've got RAR with us. And it's complete trust, absolutely complete trust. The next day, um, Stretch took the handcuffs off to this, off this chap and uh, we chatted to him again. Robin and I um, used to do the, the radio skits, which was about a 5K walk up the mountains. We got radio schedules with the, the jock and came back again and carried on retraining. We were building up our fitnesses. And then we, after, I think it was about four or five days, we returned to, to Centenary, and Robin and I were given a team to work with. There was Martin, I can't remember Martin's surname. He was decorated and got the Silver Cross. There were some remarkable soldiers. We had a, a couple of tame terrorists with us, and uh, Frilimo, ex Frilimo, and a couple of RAR. We were deployed into the Chueshi area in Centenary. We were deployed at night by Special Branch Land Rover. And this is a actually hair-raising experience. We went out in, in, you know, in two Land Rovers, Special Branch chaps deploying us. And you must remember in those days that there were police roadblocks and they stopped, there was a curfew and everybody was stopped. And uh, Special Branch had put word out that uh, they were, were deploying people or whatever it was at night, they were, they were to be given free access through the, through the road, police roadblocks, these police reserve roadblocks. When we stopped in there, as I say, it is, it is terrifying because these are open land rovers with, with the canvas canopy at the back. And in the back, uh, were half a dozen, four or five heavily armed pseudos, black troops, 
all armed with RPDs, AKs, and such like. Now, you can imagine if somebody inquisitive stuck his head in there and managed to see this, what would be the result. Anyway, nothing untoward really happened. I must have been, I didn't like the drives out. I was far happier to get on the ground and I suppose rather than alive. Anyway, we deployed into the Chueshi area. We walked in and uh, set ourselves up for that night. The next morning, we, we got we found a suitable base up place, up a copy, and uh, we sent out the chaps to, to start picking up intelligence. Now, in those days, the, the pseudo groups weren't, in, weren't so much intelligent groups seeking to call in fire force. They were, they were, they were killer groups. The object was to, was to make contact and to kill. The, they were, they were the, Martin and uh, the others were Meru and the other chaps were, were made very, very welcome uh, in the area surrounding. And we began to, to understand that the area, area was heavily subverted. The second day, I think it was, second night, we had chaps come up trying to get, come up the copy to where we were. And uh, Robin and I sort of you know, hid away and uh, the soldiers kept, kept visitors away, directly away from where we were. They're all they're all dressed as as insurgents. Oh yes, in, in, insurgent uh, insurgent gear. They, um, we had rice fleck camouflage on, uh, and uh, sorted you know sorted clothing that they had recovered. Um, I think that we had two two RPDs in the section, and the rest were all we were all the rest of us were armed with with, with AKs. Anyway, to cut cut quite a long story short. Our meeting was actually, it was arranged and uh, we sent a sit rep back to, to, to Centenary where the brigade was that, you know, we, we were arranging a meeting for that evening. We packed up our camp and put our packs on and took off just as it was getting dark. We must have walked for two or three k's at least, I suppose, maybe even longer. And uh, we sat down the crawl where we were going to make, uh, make contact with these chaps was probably 500 meters away. We mm. pushed up our head our packs and had a quick discussion and agreed that Robin, myself, and may do an RPD gunner would not go up, but we would not want to compromise the situation or make see that we were, we were Europeans, even though we were blackened up, you can still pick up the, the European features that we would, would stay stay away from the crawl and find a suitable place to, to stay out of, out, of, out of sight. We walked slowly to the, to the crawl and came past a cattle, cattle crawl, which had a fence and a, and a stone wall on the one side. And it was, it was actually an ideal position to, to wait up on. So we positioned ourselves there and uh, Martin and the other Five or six chaps went up to the to the crawl uh, to wait wait the for the insurgents of the terrorists to to make contact. We knew the passwords, and uh, we were sitting with our backs against the the against the, against the fence, and there was a concrete wall to our, our side. It was pitch black. There was myself, made with the RPD gunner, and then Robin to his to his right. We were sitting there with our you know with our, our rifles sort of AKs at the ready. And I've got, I've, look, I can't quite remember how, how, you know, the time sort of frame, it might have been half an hour, three quarters of an hour later, three or four, maybe more chaps just walked around and came out literally three or four paces in front of us. They just appeared from nowhere. They'd come through the same area that we would come through and walked across our front. They obviously saw, saw us and stopped. You know, there was, you know, who are you? And uh, Merdu gave the initial, the for the forwards of the password and they replied, was, well, and as they answered, we opened fire uh, and our instructions were, you know, what we've been trained to do was to empty, you know, our magazines completely, just to, it's just a full automatic and uh, hold them, hold the weapon low and uh, clear the area out well. So there would have been, I don't know, maybe two AKs and 60 rounds and a belt of RPD, which is another 50, 110 rounds flying around. Um, there was an incredible amount of screaming and shouting. And you know, one is one is sort of temporary blinded by the gun flashes and you know the muzzle flashes and stuff like that. Meru caught my hand and, and said to me, "Come, get, come, we must move." There was so there was a lot of crying and, and screaming from in front of us. We knew we there were wounded, there were wounded terrorists in front of us, and that we needed to get out of the area. So we moved off, and uh, I remember having you know firing a couple more rounds over the bodies as we as we sort of 
after crossed them or ran past them. And uh, we went off, making our way back to, to where we left our packs. I got separated from, from Meru and uh, had to make my way back. I didn't know where Robin was. We were, as we got to the bottom, we were fired at from the, from the rear of our, where our packs were. But a lot, obviously a lot closer, there, was fairly, there were two bursts of, of, of fairly substantial fire that came across us. And uh, after the firing had stopped, um, Martin in the top, the top there um, had, a, had a contact going up there. Anyway, the, the whole place went up in flames. The whole cruel complex went up in flames. So, the, you know, this, the whole the place was just thatch huts burning everywhere. The, the, whole, the whole sky was just lit up. And we knew we couldn't sort of stay too long. We, we, we were lit up even 500 meters away. You know, we were, we were, the place was sort of lit up you know, like daylight around us. We sat there. I, we waited for a bit. We got the rest of the team came together. Um, I got to the radio and sent a coded message through to, to Centenary that we'd had a contact. Uh, that we had put down a number of terrorists, that there were wounded people there. And I also said that Robin Hughes, who was Sunray, uh, that he was missing. And at, at this stage, we had, uh, they asked, they did ask whether there was anything untoward. And I said, no, not at this stage. Um, we did get separated, but we have got a crash RV, which we would use in an emergency. If any of us got separated, we knew where, to, where, we, where we had to go to. So we waited probably for, for half an hour after putting the, uh, the radio call through. Tim, I really wanted to go back. There was something niggling in me very, very bad. And I wanted to go back into the area to where the contract had been. And I, sp I spoke to the, to the soldiers and I just said, oh, you know, I need to go back. And they said, you can't go back in there. Um, we don't know who's alive in there and whether they're wounded. And you're going to jeopardize the, you know, the security of the patrol if you go back in again, which did actually make sense. Anyway, um, we set off and we got to the crash RV, which was probably a kilometer, maybe a mile away, and at a bridge on the road. And I sat down, we sat down there quietly as we approached, we crawled up close and I whistled, that little guinea fowl whistle. No reply from Robin, you know, no reply. He waited, called again, called again, called again. And I knew he would answer if he was there. Nothing came. So he pulled back a bit and I got onto the radio again and, uh, to say, look, we were at the crash RV and that, that Robin wasn't there. The jock then advised me that uh, troops have been deployed into the area. They were sending out support troops and that they would rendezvous with us at a school a couple of miles away. And I was to make my way there. So we looked at the map, carefully found out where the school was. And, you know, it's difficult at night trying to orientate yourself. And you got the directions. I've got the directions a little bit muddled up. But uh, probably after about five, ten minutes, you know, you suddenly you think, well, the moon's in a different, different area. We're walking in the wrong direction. We're walking in the opposite direction where we should have been. So we spun around and made our way towards the school. We drew closer. We could hear, we could see the lights coming in and then the lights stopped and I got onto the radio there and I made contact with the, 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 the officer coming in. They were RAR troops. It was a Lieutenant Mayering who'd come, who'd come out and I just you know, talked to him quietly. I just said, listen, please just keep your troops right away. We're gonna come in now. We're coming in a single file and uh, please just keep your troops right away so, so there is no accidents. We came in, um, we were taken, put onto an RL as I remember, and uh, we were sent straight out the area and got back to, to our camp in Centenary and the farm we were staying at in the early hours, early hours of the morning. I washed the bath and then first light, took the one of our one of our land rovers and then drove to Centenary and to find out what the story was. When I went into the to the ops tent, there was the, the brigadier was there, uh, John Hickman and uh, Neil Creel, Dolby Pierce and Mick Graham. You know, my, knee, my first question was, where's, you know, what's happened to Robin? And Mick Graham was the one that broke the news to me. Robin didn't make it. He'd been shot through the head and uh, and he hasn't made it back. You know, soul destroyed. But I just think of it now, you know, um, a volunteer and first operation, and just tragedy. I had to go back and break the news to, to, the, to the soldiers, to, the, to, to our group, which I did. They were absolutely dumb, dumbstruck. They didn't believe that, you know, anything had gone wrong either. Um, but that niggling feeling that I had 
uh, after the contact, when he'd gone back to get to our pack, you know, our packs, there was just something wrong somewhere. And I, I, you know, I didn't remember how to put my finger onto what it was, but it's just that horrible feeling that something has gone wrong. Mike, he must um, have been hit in that opening exchange. I, I don't know whether, you know, it, it, it wasn't that opening exchange. I, I understood from, I think I'm correct in saying, and uh, I think it's, I've written this whole, whole story up in the men speak for Jonathan Pitterway. I wrote this whole, whole story up. And from what I learned subsequently that Robin was shot near the fence, shot through the head through the fence. Now, I, I, I can't substantiate that. I, 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 I never went into, the, into the, all those details. And uh, it was actually a, a tragedy of note. Mm. Um, Gretel, I understood afterwards, Gretel, Robin's wife, had asked Paul Kutzia not to allow him to go, you know, to, to do this to your um, attachment to the, to the regular army or to special branch. She may have had a premonition as well. It was very, very sad. So to, to complete the story, we were deployed again the next night the day after, so we had one day back at camp, and you know this old adage that once if you fall off a horse, you've got to get back onto it as soon as you possibly can, otherwise you lose your nerve. We were deployed again into another area, uh, the same group. Um, I took the uh, I was in charge of them, and we went into other. We spent I think it was three nights trying to make contact uh, with another with the, with the groups, any groups in the area, which we didn't it didn't uh, come into you know come happen. And uh, we were pulled out after three nights. And look, the chaps were very, very weary. And uh, but it was a good exercise. It was a good exercise. You understand the the reasoning behind it because it uh, gives you confidence again that you're with a good team of men. And uh, as as we later had on the pseudo operations, those chaps would lay your li their lives down for you. And I, I witnessed it in a, in, a, in a contact later on um, with Basil when I was with Basil Moss, working with Basil Moss and an extended team. They went back to get a, a wounded, and they went back under heavy fire to get one of the wounded soldiers out. It was actually an amazing, amazing thing to, to see. So it was, it was a really good exercise. But coming back to, going back to Robin, I came back to Rory to, to, to attend Robin's funeral. And I was requested to go uh, to CIO offices now. And I spent, I think, best part of two or three hours with Ken Flower. And we were talking through the, the pseudo concept. And he wanted to know whether I believed that we should continue with this with this this mode of operations. And I told him quite frankly, I, I said I to believe it is it is probably the only way to go and to get intelligence. So we you know so we had a long chat about it. We discussed various operations and uh, the contact men and and, and formations and bits and pieces. Like it was actually a very interesting discussion. He also asked me to go and uh, to, the, to the Hughes family to go and talk to the Hughes family. I had never met him. I had met Gretel. That was a very, very, that was a tough experience that they, you know, they were very, very good to me, very gentle with me. But it must have been incredibly hard for them as well. Um, incredibly hard for them, you know, to, to listen to the story. You know, as I could tell them as much as I could tell them, which I was allowed to tell them. And Robin, uh, we attended Robin's funeral, it was a military funeral. And uh, you're saying goodbye to a very, very dear friend. And uh, we become, you know, at 10 days, two weeks that we'd worked together, you know, we'd be, we become very, very firm friends. And it was actually, you know, it was devastating. Mike, the um, chaps, uh, talk a, let's move on to um, another great soldier and conservationist, basically, uh, Tim Wellington, who was um, also, uh, he was an SAS man. Um, but very, very committed to his life as a game ranger. Um, and he also left us too early. Just a little bit about Tim and what happened there. Yeah, Tim was an ex Michael House schoolboy. Um, his father was an uh, Anglican minister, an Anglican padre. Tim came to the department from KwaZulu Natal, where he was a game control officer. I met him when I was posted to, to Robbins. I was sent up from, from head office. I was promoted to ward. I was a warden at the time, warden roving control. I was then transferred to, to Robbins as warden, warden Robbins. And Tim was the range of trails. Uh, trails had been moved up from 
Mabaluta donkey trolls have been moved up from Mabaluta where they were no longer, uh, where they can no longer be, be undertaken because of the war situation down there. That was in 76. So Tim, the pack, all the pack equipment, the uh, stuff like that was, was sent up to Robbins and Tim was the, to be the trails officer there. Now Tim was an outstanding ranger. He absolutely outstanding ranger. You could, you could just see it from his, his, his stature. Whatever he did, he would do it to the to his to to the best standard, the highest standard was you know it was possible. He did one trail up there, um, and then was one of my ranchers for a short period of time before he was I think called up to the SAS and Birch, not quite on on permanent call up, but he was doing a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, SAS call ups, and uh, he did. He volunteered shortly after after coming to 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 Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. He volunteered for active service or to do his army training. He was you know, an immigrant. And uh, there again, typical Tim, not to satisfy to, to just to do national service. I, if I'm going to do it, I will go to the best unit I can do and I will pass, which he did. He passed his selection course and uh, became a, a, a member of, of C Squadron. Tim, um, was later posted to, to Mauna Pools as, as ranger in charge there, senior ranger. He was given the name Bonongwe uh, by the Game Scouts. Uh, Bonongwe me comes from the, the it's a common name for the, for the plant is pigweed. It, it's a the rank weed. It, it's, it's sort of pink, red structure. It's fairly coarse and grows to, to uh, fairly high. And Tim's nickname was Bonongwe. Um, but so he, he, was a, he was a dedicated, dedicated officer. I've, I've had the privilege to read some of his letters that he wrote to his fiance at the time was uh, Jennifer Bay. They later married and I have been in contact with her. She's remarried now. It's Jennifer, Jennifer Pelham, Jenny Pelham. And I do, make, I do maintain contact with, with her. And his letters are actually just tell of his absolute dedication. He loved his photography. It didn't matter what, what the creature was, whether it was a field mouse, an elephant, whether it was a little prinia or a martial eagle, whether it was a weed or a giant baobab, Tim was interested in everything. Everything mattered to him. All things in creation mattered to him, I can put it that way. Um, they had a role to play and uh, he was interested in everything and would study them. His greatest joy was being out in, in the, on patrol where he was probably at one with nature. Minor floodplain was properly flooded. And the water came right up to the, um, the edge of the fort and then subsided. And we put photographs of Tim wading through, through waters on the floodplain, back on his back and incredibly happy. And he used to do these extended patrols, 10 days walking down to Chori, patrolling Mona, <coughs> checking, checking on, 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 on birds, bird's nest, looking at every little thing, collecting plant specimens, spending as much time as he could. The camera, he was a very, very, very good uh, photographer and just collecting pictures. After Mana, Tim was posted to, to Wanky Management Unit under Clem could see him. It was called, Clem called him Appy. Um, maybe because it was, Tim was just so keen to learn, you know, that, that Tim nicknamed him Appy. And which is, is probably very, very sort of astute of Clem because uh, Tim just needed to learn, needed to grasp, needed to progress. And nothing was ever too much trouble for him to do, mechanical wise, foot wise, anything. I can't remember how long he was actually at main camp, or sorry, at Adam Chibi. I think it was a Sunday or a Saturday or a Sunday that an elephant was wounded outside the park uh, on a. On a, a either concession or a hunting area, a very big bull, and uh, it crossed, it was wounded and it crossed into the park. And the, the it was reported. And uh, Tim and Clem would, Clem would ask to go out and, and deal with the, with this wounded animal, follow it up and put it down. And it was, it was a very, very big, one of those very big wanky bulls. Uh, they set off, they picked up the tracks, they went back to the boundary, picked up the tracks and started to follow. And it's, it's, it's um, pertinent to mention that Clem had just um, had Bilhazia treatment 
and uh, I think it might have been that Ambalhar treatment, whatever it was, he wasn't, you know, wasn't 100%, but Clem knew there was a job to do, and they went off together. They caught up with the elephant, I think, mid-morning, it might have been 12 o'clock, I'm not quite sure, but mid-morning, she was about right on it, and it was at a pan Tim sort, and ran ahead. Uh, Clem lost sight of him, there was a shot, and nothing else. When Tim, when Clem got to, to the pan, Tim was, was down, and uh, I'm not sure whether he had passed away at that stage or whether he was still alive, but if he was alive, if he was alive at that stage, I don't know. Say, um, and he, uh, he didn't, the elephant had uh, fatally trampled him and uh, killed him. Was it, I'm trying to think of the, um, was the elephant, when it was. Was the elephant still alive? The elephant had uh, disappeared. Kim followed it up later it might have been the same afternoon and put it down. Tim's bullet had, I'm trying to think whether it had gone two inches too high, inch and a half too high, or inch and a half, two inches too low, like for a frontal brain shot. But you know, with a, with a big wanky bull, uh, that makes all the difference. It had, didn't even pause. It just, it, 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 it just ran over Tim, which is actually very, very sad and killed him. Um, it was, that was uh, 24th of October, 1979. That Tim was killed. He was 26 years old, a senior ranger, and you know another tragic, tragic loss. Tim would have got a long way in our department. I do believe that at the time he, you know, well, well, relatively short space of time, he would have made it up to to um, a rank warden. He was a senior ranger, and he would have made a magnificent uh, station head running, you know, in the department. But that wasn't to be, and he hadn't been married, married very long, and. Uh, Absolute tragedy that I didn't, I couldn't get to his funeral, unfortunately. I was down at Mobaluta in the Gona Resort um, at the time, and I, 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 I couldn't get out to his, his, his funeral. But it was, it was another tragic time for the department. He was the first person that we actually lost on active field duty. Several people had been injured by elephants. Some had been, like Bill, uh, Willie de Beer had been scratched very badly mauled, not scratched, very badly mauled by lions. Um, Paul Reed had been thrown around by Tostin and, and gored by a buffalo. Oliver Coltman had been damaged or gored by a buffalo. Dolph Sassine. Uh, Dolph, Dolph Sassine uh, had a very, very nasty experience with, with an elephant. As it had Andy Pugh, who was another one extremely lucky to get away with his life with an elephant. But tragically, um, Tom was the only one we lost on you know, active field duty. But, you know, when you think of the... The work that we did with elephants, with wildlife, it speaks something to the training um, and the care that the, our seniors took in tutoring the, you know, all our ranges and, and stuff like that. You know, speaks volumes for the caliber of men that, mm -hmm. that they were. They were never thrown out in the deep end, never thrown out in the deep end. They always would tutor you properly. And only when you were competent, they felt that you were competent to handle a situation where they allow you to go and deal with something. And uh, as I say, speaks volumes for the chaps that were in charge. So Hannah said that was that was that was a Tim Wellington story, and I must just just mention that um, Tim was also um, awarded a, a medal. Uh, he was. I'm just trying to just pick up which which medal he was. He was he was in, uh, a member of the Legion of Merit, uh, and he was awarded that um, at Government House. So yes, uh, three good men. Yeah. Willie de, Bar Willie de Beer died. I'm just trying to work it out when it was. I'm just trying to think when Willie, Willie died uh, at Rua. Well, how can we put it? It was just a closing of a chapter. They all were closing chapters. Mike, thanks for your time. Yeah, okay. Um, Anas, well, thanks so much indeed. And uh, there's a lot to talk about still. And uh, we'll just see how we go. Yeah. But thanks for that, Mike. Very interesting.